and it seems that many get distracted about fighting people and fighting each other instead of joining God. Ephesians 6 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil in the day, and having done all to stand firm. I'm saying this because I think people in my generation need to wake up and to open their eyes. Whether you're a Christian or not, we've been blinded, fooled, and tricked. From day one, the enemy's first words in the garden were, Did God really say? The enemy's plot is to wiggle into the perfect communion of God and man and plant doubt, worry, bitterness, and envy. He wants people to think that with God, we're missing out. Here are some key words that you'll hear in any conversation revolving religion or politics. Freedom, comfort, rights, independence, equality, progress. Pretty, right? Beautiful words backed up by beautiful videos of homosexuals kissing and women having empowering abortions and white people being idiots and marriages being shattered. Our nation is topsy-turvy backwards. We proclaim freedom. America's about freedom. While actually every political decision that we're making that seems oh so progressive is reverting us backwards to depravity and condemnation. Satan is an imitator. The enemy manipulates, and he has no tricks of his own, so he can only twist and poison what God has meant for good. Go back to the garden. Everything was perfect. Man was walking with God in the cool of the day, in the most glorious creation. There's nothing oppressive about that. God gave full abundant life, saying, This is all so very good. Take and eat. Live with me. Satan takes the one rule that God has set in place to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have all of this, but for your sake, don't eat this. That one rule that was made for our protection and provision, Satan checks that rule and says, it's a prison. He whispers through his little tongue to Eve, you will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God knowing good and evil. Satan says his best lie, your eyes will be opened. While God has shielded us from evil, Satan allures us with it, his promise of knowledge and power, but there's only death. Here are some words that the word describes Christianity by. This is the world, this is people who are non-believers. I will say that word, a non-believer, calls Christians this, exclusive, oppressive, abusive, and ignorant. I've been called all of those. Let's look at two words in the verse from Ephesians 6, talking about the spiritual battle. There's two words, in and over. The verse tells us to be strong in the Lord. God calls us to join in with his victorious kingdom. He invites us into freedom and full, abundant life. What's the opposite? Sin. It rules over us. It's dominion, not a kingdom. It's dominion. It's weighty. It's dominant. Satan chains us to itself until we are slaves without hope of our own escape. What sounds oppressive to you? In or over? Oppressive. I am sick of the word oppressive because there's nothing more freeing than Jesus Christ, my Lord. There's nothing more imprisoning than the evil of this rebellious world. The whole world revolves around the idea, this whole war, excuse me, revolves around the idea of obedience. Satan's first goal was to trick us into disobeying God. And the Creator encouraged Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, 
to live, to care for the earth, to enjoy his presence. The enemy tainted that relationship with the lie that disobeying meant more freedom. To do what God said not to do makes you more powerful. Satan still tells us this today. He lies. Satan says, break out of the strict morality of the church and find true knowledge. Become more educated and you'll know what is fun. And you can move forward. You can progress. Leave behind the word of God that tells us that what's black and white. God tells us black and white. But he says, this is what you need to think, say, and do. But Satan says, live in the gray. Here, everything's relative. You can be whoever, whatever you want to be. Gender, doesn't matter. Obedience, doesn't matter. Abortion, eh, it's your life. You're never wrong. You can hate the church. You can run from that oppressive community. You'll be good. You'll be better for it. I've seen time and time again people that I dearly love running from God because it costs too much to obey. They've been a tricked thinking that obedience will stifle their freedom when actually we can't even live without it. See, if you understand this, if Adam and Eve had obeyed and not eaten the fruit, they would have lived forever. Death came because they went against the word of God. Death isn't like, oh crap, yeah, I was there before, so maybe I should obey with this life I have. Death is a result of disobedience. And there's two paths. It's black and white. Two paths. Life or death. Life or death. Obedience or rebellion. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy. This is from Moses. He says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I commanded you by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his statutes and rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and to serve them, I declare to you today, you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, he says, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is from Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. And so he says there's two options, blessing or curse, flourish or perish. There's no relativism here. There's no gray area. Why? Because it doesn't exist. There's a truth and there's a not truth. It isn't wishy-washy. We're fallen. We can't believe we think what we think is good for us. We can't trust the lies that God's holding out on us. Satan tells us God is holding out on us. God is not, I repeat, not holding out on us. He's not holding out on us. God is holding on to us. We've messed up big time by disobeying him. But he's giving us the option to repent. 180 turn, to turn away from our rebellion and come back. He calls us to return. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He won't count our iniquities against us if we come with broken hearts asking for healing and renewal. Like foolish sheep, we have strayed away, but God has made a way. Jesus is always the answer. He's obedient for us. Jesus is good for us because we can't. I fail daily. 
but Christ's blood has covered all my wrongs. Why? Why does he want us to obey? So he can take the fun away from sin. Don't drink this. Don't do that. Don't have sex. Because he wants to brainwash us. No, because he loves us. And he wants us to live. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world. The world that he sent his one and only son. That whosoever, anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What is exclusive about that? What's oppressive about that? He loved the world, that whosoever. He's exchanging death for life because he loves us. My grandmother is 80 years old and a total rock star. Last week she spoke at a conference and this was her topic. There is no retirement in a time of war. Ecclesiastes 8.8 we can't discharge from the battle when there's a war happening. But many Christians are. Many people who claim to love God don't obey God. She gave the example of Daniel who stood firm and took action. Daniel didn't back down. He feared the king instead of the king. He interpreted God's word and told the king, your days are numbered. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You're wrong. Daniel spoke truth. He prayed and for that, was thrown into the lion's den. He was thrown into the lion's den. Life isn't la -di da if you obey God. My life isn't easy. Persecution and punishment are guaranteed from the world, but protection and provision of God are promised. Persecution and punishment are guaranteed if you obey God, but we are also promised protection and provision from God. Daniel trusted in God and the mouth of the lions were shut. That doesn't happen naturally. The Lord is mighty and no weapon formed against me can stand. The gates of hell could not prevail against the power of God. If God is for us, who could ever stop us? If God is with us, what could stand against? Our God is greater. Here is Daniel's prayer. Daniel says in Daniel 9, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we've sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We haven't listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, to all the peoples of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness but to us open shame, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us. Daniel prays, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we don't present our pleas to you because of our righteousness. They didn't have any. We don't present our pleas to you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy, O oh Lord. Hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, pay attention, O oh Lord, act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. That's from Daniel 9. And the response that Daniel got to his prayer from the angel of the Lord was this. Daniel, you are dearly loved. And then Daniel's given this vision of the justice of God against the evil of the world. Really go read it. The Lord is sovereign and all-powerful. God is righteous and God is good. As I said, there is a battle taking place. And we are called to stand firm and to take action. Here's what helps us fight the word. The, here's what helps us fight the lies. The word of God. The word of God is our truth. We must fight every if of the enemy with an it is written of the Lord. The devil knows scripture. Do you? God gave us his word and his word. Jesus is called the word of God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In Hebrews he says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. 
So in the Old Testament, the prophets are speaking the word of God. What's written in the beginning of this book was told to men in their ears. And then he says, but in these last days, boom, in the New Testament, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom Jesus, he also created the world. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint, thumbprint of his nature. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So God's given us his word and his word, Jesus. First John says God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of my favorite verses is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. There's just one truth, one truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ. God has made himself known. He's revealed himself to us by four things. He's, God has revealed himself by his creation, his word, his son, and his spirit. First creation, look outside. That is not some accident. You were made molded by a creator God. Romans 1 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. So we've traded this for this, and it says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. He's also revealed himself through his word. Joshua 1, 8 through 9 says, This book of your law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, chew on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to it all that is written in it. For then you will make your day prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, he says, be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So he's revealed himself through creation, through word, and through his son. Romans 6 says, but now you have been set free from sin. And you have become slaves of God. Obey him. The fruit that you get leads to sanctification, to being made holy. And its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin, the payment of sin, the price of your disobedience is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In who? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Creation, Word, Son, and Spirit. This is a good verse. He's revealed himself in his spirit. Romans 8, 12-17 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, 
Abba, Father, we get to call God Daddy. The Spirit, listen up, the Spirit himself bears witness, testifies, tells our spirit. What? What does it tell our spirit? That we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. <clears throat> My middle school girls asked me this at our last Bible study. How do we know that God is real? <laughs> they said, what if Christianity and other, like, what makes Christianity true and why are other religions not right? Like, why can we say they're wrong? What if we get to the end of the life? What if we die and find out there's nothing? They're in seventh grade and they asked me that. How do we know? My heart did crazy awesome backflips. Praise God that they are so honest and open to wrestle with the idea of God at such a young age. I am thankful that they are vulnerable enough to ask questions now that most people don't even think about until they're in college, until they're my age. They haven't thought about this idea. They did it because they heard it at church. They didn't ask God and ask each other, how do we know? I told the girls what I just said, the above, that he's made himself known. It is so evident. Our invisible God is able to be seen by creation, heard in his word, saved by his son and felt by his spirit. We talked about how every religion is an attempt to follow eight noble paths or pray five times a day towards Mecca in order to reach nirvana or receive blessing or enter nothingness or be perfect or be out of the cycle of karma. <clears throat> Jesus is radically different. Judaism, the foundation of Christianity, had religion. Follow these lips, lips, follow these rules, worship him with your lips, obey God. Christ is radically different. He wants a relationship. Our God made us to know him and to walk with him. Yes, there were laws. There were laws that we could not keep. The words, do not worship any other idols. God says this, I'm God, I'm the Lord. Please, for your sake, for my glory, don't worship idols. Those words were broken right when Moses walked down from the mountain and the stupid people are praying to a golden calf. They're saying, this God is who we've made because we can see him. So we break laws. But where every other religion is an instruction manual to get yourself out of the pit, to... Uh, just pretend like there's no pain and you will be out of the pit. Pretend um, or follow these rules or be super good and you'll get out. Jesus says, uh-uh, you can't save yourself. Jesus is the only Lord who jumps in the pit, takes the punishment for us, throws us out of the pit, gives us life in return, rises from the dead, buries the pit and says, I am truth. He's given us life. And it's not about what we do. It's about what he's done. Religions say, do this, do this, do this. Jesus says, it is done. It is finished. I have paid the price for you. So believe, repent, obey me. I want to know you, God says. The girls asked, what if we die and find out there's nothing? What if we live our life going to church and then death is just a black empty void? I said, that's a great question. That's doubt and unbelief that I wrestle with myself. But I asked them this. I turned it back on them. I said, what if we lived like there's nothing? Like this life is for ourselves. We can do what we want, live in comfort and pleasure disobey God, and then after death, found out this is true, found out God is right. The word says that one day, every knee, every knee, 
every knee will bow and every tongue confess, proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee and every tongue will look at the King of Kings in the face and cry out, You are the way! You are the truth and the life! You got her right. You got her just. And he will say, I knew you or I didn't. Come be with me or away from me. I never knew you. I gave you a gift that you didn't receive. You chose to worship the creature rather than the creator. What will you hear on that day? Will you be with the Lord or separated from him forever? Think about it. It's a hard concept, hell. We think we're great. We think we deserve heaven. We are so fallen. So one of the seventh graders asked me, well, why doesn't God just make everybody believe? Why does he even give them, give them a choice? Why, why does God say, okay, love me if you want to? So this is what I did. In crazy Abby fashion, I picked up a pillow, threw it at her face, and I said, love me! You have to love me! I command you right now to love me. You have no choice. Love me. Obey me. They <laughs> shivered in fear. This little sweet Bible study turned into, what the crap is going on? They were shocked. Silent. <laughs> and then they giggled. They nodded as they understood. That's not love. Forcing someone to love you. So next, I handed one of them the same pillow, very gently, with the hugest smile on my face. I got up, I put it behind her back, and I put another one in her lap. She had pillows upon pillows upon pillows. I gave her my cup of water. I brushed her hair. I said, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you no matter what. And I, I want you to love me too. You don't have to, but I promise, full life, good things. I love you. The choice is yours. I asked the girls which one was better, and they all agreed that a loving God is better than a scary God. The crazy thing is that he is so holy and awesome, he deserves to demand praise. He has the right to say, love me, because all glory belongs to him. But God is not a manipulative puppeteer in the sky. Our God gives us the free will choice to obey. He says, I have life abundant and love unconditional for you if you obey and if you walk in my ways. He says, let Christ make you whole. He paid the price on my behalf. But a gift has to be received. He says, you can either believe or reject him. I, Abigail Sutton Arthur, was wallowing in my blood, dead in sin, and the Spirit said to me, live. So I choose life. As for me, I'll serve the Lord. I will obey, because without Him, I am nothing. I've been through the valleys and learned that God is sufficient for me. Christ alone, He's all I need. He's an ever-present help in trouble. He's my rock in shaky times. Life is tough either way. With God or without God, the storms come. No matter what, we will face hard times. But if we're hidden in Him, we can withstand and not fall away like the perishing sand. So that's the good news of the gospel. That is Jesus Christ. And the gospel is why I'm not politically correct. The gospel is why I'm against abortion, on acting out on homosexuality, why I'm against feminism, why I'm against sin. I confront touchy subjects and I'll call them out for what they are. Lies and schemes of the enemy. Lies of freedom that chain us to our sin. When we say no to God, we put ourselves on the throne of our hearts. We rebel and say, not thy will, but mine. Mine, my mine, mine, mine. I'm God, we scream, shaking our fists in his face. 
When we go against his word, we say, mm, you're wrong, I know better, I'm right, I choose creation over the creator. I choose foolishness instead of truth. First John says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, but the world listens to them. We're from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that is, he has made to dwell in us. But God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Here's what I'm saying. We must fear God rather than man. We must fear God, not fear man. Fear God. Stand for truth. Matthew says, Have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. My computer's dying. Please stand by for technical difficulties. It says, have no fear of them, for nothing that is covered will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What God tells you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than the sparrows. Then he says this, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, Jesus will also deny before his Father in heaven. He says, don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. He said, I've not come to bring peace, this friendship with, with sin, but a sword. This is the sword of God. He says, for I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and a person Enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Christians, we are sheep among wolves. It says, be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Know the schemes of the enemy, but live in the purity of Christ's cleanliness. Obey God our Father. Those verses are strong, so hear me out. This is not an excuse to hate. I'm not telling you to say God hates bags. Our highest calling and our first command as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, is to love, to wash feet, to eat dinner with the least of these, to give our lives away and to preach the truth, to love. Love does not mean 
patting a sinner on the head. You're good. Welcome to church. Jesus didn't say to the woman at the well, Great job! High five, girl! I'm so glad that you're a whore. I love that you have five husbands. That's not love. Jesus told the woman at the well, I am the fountain of living waters. He called her to repentance, to change her ways. Her life was changed. She went from deathly shame to obedient freedom. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus is meeting you at the well. He's calling you to repentance. So bow your knee. Confess that he is Lord. It's evident. He's made himself known. I say this is a battle and war, but please don't think that when I'm saying something controversial, when I'm wrestling with politics, that I'm against you, that I'm against liberals. This battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against my friends who don't know God. It's against the enemy. I'm in God's kingdom to fight for truth. So I love everyone I come into contact with. Whatever they believe, I love them. Remember, love is not approval. It's acceptance. It's knowing that truth does not allow me to be silent. Truth does not allow me to be silent towards the ones I love. To love my neighbor means that I seek their best interest. And I know that I know that I know that life only exists in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, my Savior, is the only way we can live. If we're, to, if, we're, if we're dead to sin, we can't still live in it. Ephesians 2 says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Over here, you're dead in the trespasses. Mm, you messed up in the sins. You've missed the mark in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit that's now at work, in the sons of disobedience. So over here, we're following either way, following truth, following disobedience. He said, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Guys, I'm a sinner. I was over here carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. By nature, we were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good news of Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Go read Ephesians 2. He's saying, you're dead over here. You deserve wrath. You deserve hell. But God has mercy on us. God has mercy so that we can come over here to life in abundant grace. The cross is the bridge between life Sorry, between death and life, between a curse and a blessing. So where are you at? I dare you to wrestle with God. Like my seventh grade girls, ask him the hard questions. I yelled at God in the car because I didn't understand. He wants you to be honest. He says he opens his ear to all those who call on him in truth. May today be the day of your salvation. May today be the day that you come to know the lover of your soul. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of the Lord, if you believe, you better proclaim his glory. You better speak the goodness of God into the dark. You better not align yourself with the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Proclaim the goodness of God into the dark. Our country is dark. 
Our nation is no longer under God. The leader of America has set himself against God when he went against the word by what the president says and does. We've got to pray for revival. But more than that, we've got to start living like the church. We have to confront and engage with our culture. Not hide away from it, not say, oh, scary, politics. And not agree with it. Don't line yourself up with the sins of the world. It says, confront, engage, wrestle. Be the church. You better be prepared because trials are coming. It is going to be harder and harder to be a Christian in America. Don't be lukewarm. He spits lukewarm out of his mouth. <clears throat> he says, mm -mm, you're for me or against me. He says, be zealous, passionate, and repent. Our reward is in heaven. Our reward isn't heaven. Our reward is in heaven. Christ Jesus is your reward. And he promises he's coming. He will be here soon. Do you know him? I'm going to close with this passage from Revelation 22. The end of the word. He says, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He says, Blessed are those who wash their robes and do my commandments so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates, may come into heaven. Outside the gates, he says, are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, he says, have sent my angel to testify about these things to the churches. He's made himself known. I am the root, the descendant of David. He says, I'm the bright morning star. Here I am. I'm Christ. The spirit and the bride, the body of church say, come, Jesus. And the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty Come to the water of life without price. We don't have to pay for our life, Christ did. Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Whoever's watching this, I don't even know why I'm doing this, except to reach to people who need the salvation of God. And for those who are saved who need to not shrink back, but to fear God, obey Him, speak for Him. Choose truth. Choose obedience. Choose life. I beg you, choose Jesus.